Hello everyone and welcome back to another Commander Quick Look. I have been wanting to get another one of these out for you. Uh, I want to just start making this more of a regular thing for me. Uh, my Quick Looks are generally pretty popular and I'd love to just keep that going here on the channel. So without further ado, I want to look at, um, I think it's a legendary creature that's kind of gone under the radar. I know it was popular when he was first uh, spoiled, when he was first brought up. And now I just want to talk about him a little more, and that would be Runo Stormkirk. Runo Stormkirk is a 3-mana, 1-4, flying vampire cleric for 1, a blue, and a black. So that right there is just a lot of stuff already. And Runo actually flips. So let's just go ahead and break down his first side before we get into the back side. So the first side, which is the Runo Stormkirk side, uh, has flying. When Runo Stormkirk enters the battlefield, put up to one target creature card from your graveyard on the top of your library. At the beginning of your upkeep, look at the top card of your library. You may reveal that card. If a creature card with mana value 6 or greater is revealed this way, transform Runo Stormkirk. So right away, just looking at his base abilities, just base what Runo is, he's a 3-mana 1-4 flyer. So he's a good blocker. He's not really going to be attacking, but he's cheap for your commander being at 3-mana, which is pretty much a good starting point for commanders. Going a little higher around the 5-6-mana to six mana side just means that you're not playing your commander early enough. But Runo comes down early. He can block uh, being at 4 toughness, which is really nice. And then he doesn't die to a lot of stuff, uh, being lightning bolts or shocks or anything like that, so he's not a weak creature. Uh, then he synergizes with himself, so he's going to put a card from our graveyard on the top of our library. And then, hypothetically, if we don't draw that card at our next turn, uh, we're going to reveal the top card of our library. And if it's something 6 or greater, we transform Runo Stormkirk into Krothus. Lord of the Deep, uh, which also has flying. It's a 3-5, so he gets a 2 boost to his power and 1 boost to his toughness, so he's still a good blocker in the air. When Krothus, Lord of the Deep, attacks, create a tapped and attacking token that's a copy of another target attacking creature. If that creature is a Kraken, Leviathan, or Oct Octopus, or Serpent, create two of those tokens instead. So we don't necessarily need to be on theme with the Kraken, Leviathan, Octopus, or Serpent, but we really want to because that's just going to be thematically really cool for our deck. And who wouldn't want to make two of one thing instead of just one? So right away, uh, we're actually going to be looking, just dive right into the big, beefy boys of this deck. So right away... We're going to be looking at Hallbreaker Horror, which is a new card from Innistrad Crimson Vow, which is amazing, and it's been in all of the control decks. So it's 7 mana, 5 blue blue for a Flash Kraken Horror. Then this spell can't be countered, so it already comes in at Flash on your opponent's end step. It can't be countered, so it's got really good protection for itself. And then whenever we cast a spell, choose up to 1, return target spell you don't control to its owner's hand, or return target non-land permanent to its owner's hand. So that can be our stuff, that can be our opponent's stuff. This thing is basically just a counterspell uh, waiting to happen. So if you have anything with Flash or you cast anything on your turn uh, or your opponent's turn, you can return straight up spells if it's an instant uh, that you're casting or if you're casting a giant Kraken and you can return a blocker uh, that your opponent controls to their hand. So the Hullbreaker Horror is just great. It's going to transform Runo. And it's just great on its own. And then if we make tokens which don't get exiled by Krothus, uh, that's just what we want. So imagine casting one spell and we get to return three permanents or whatnot because Krothus is going to make two token copies of the Hallbreaker Horror. Uh, next is actually going to be the Serpent of Yawning Depths. So for four blue blue, so that's also going to flip Runo. The Kraken... Krakens, Leviathans, Octopus, and Serpents, so everything that Runo or Krothus cares about, uh, you control can't be blocked except by Kraken, Leviathan, Octopus, and Serpents. So basically, our opponents most likely aren't going to be running uh, this kind of like tribal-ish synergy kind of thing going on that we have. So the Serpent of Yawning Depths is just something that's going to flip Krothus, it's going to flip Runo into Krothus for us. And then it's going to be a 6-6, six, six, and it just basically says... Our stuff can't be blocked for the rest of the game. So this thing, it doesn't really have a super strong uh, end to the battlefield or anything like that, but it's basically just going to let us win the game if it sticks around. Next is Nemesis of Reason, one of my favorite cards in uh, my Demir Mill decks that I used to build when I first started playing Commander. 
Nemesis of Reason is three blue and black. A Leviathan Horror being at three power and seven toughness. Kind of odd on the pairing there. But whenever Nemesis of Reason attacks, Defending Player puts the top ten cards of their library into their graveyard. And that's it. So it's got a really big toughness on it so it can attack in and hopefully not die. It's going to have to get blocked by quite a few things. And we get to just mill our opponents for 10, which is kind of fun. doesn't really do anything with that. doesn't really synergize. Um, and unfortunately, this card isn't going to flip Runo because it's only 5 mana. But I just thought it was cool because I always loved building with this card in my early EDH days. Next is Breaching Leviathan, which is 7 blue blue, which is definitely going to flip Runo. For this 9-9 Leviathan, when Breaching Leviathan enters the battlefield, if you cast it from your hand, tap all non-blue creatures. Those creatures don't untap during their controller's end steps. So it's just a 9-9 that pairing with our Serpent of Yawning Depths can't be blocked. It's going to end the game pretty quickly, especially if we cast it from our hands. It's just going to shut everyone else down and let us attack in for some big damage and hopefully take out an opponent or two. Next, we have the Storm Surge Kraken, which again is not going to flip Bruno because it's at 4 mana, but it is a 5-5 five, five for 5 with Hexproof, and it has Lieutenant. So that means as long as we control Runo, our commander, the Storm Surge Kraken gets plus 2, plus 2, and has whenever it deals, or whenever it becomes blocked, you may draw 2 cards. So the, this is just going to pair really well with Crothus when we make two copies of this thing. Whenever it becomes blocked, which a 5-5 five five is going to start getting blocked pretty soon after we deal uh, a few combats worth of damage. It's got Hexproof, so it can't be targeted. And these tokens with Hexproof that are also going to just draw us two cards, it's basically going to become a Consecrated Sphinx towards the end of the game. The Spawning Kraken for five and a blue. When a Kraken, Leviathan, Octopus, or Serpent you control deals combat damage to a player, create a 9-9 blue Kraken creature token. Pretty self-explanatory on the synergy there. So if we use Crothus and we make two token copies of the spawning Kraken, then deal damage, we're going to have three copies, three copies of the spawning Kraken that are going to say make a blue blue, uh, or a 9 9-9 a uh, Kraken token is just going to start overvaluing our opponents once we start getting that rolling. Next is the Trench Behemoth for 5 and blue blue. Return a land you control to its owner's hand. Untap the Trench Behemoth. It gains hexproof, so it's just got built-in protection there. Whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, target creature and opponent controls attacks during its controller's next combat phase. So the Trench Behemoth doesn't really have... Uh, something going on it with attacks or blocks or ETBs or anything, but basically it's going to uh, have protection on it at 7-7, seven, seven, which is a pretty big body. Uh, we can return to land, give it hexproof so it's got protection. Then whenever land enters, so we can trigger its ability by returning a land if we don't play one that turn. Uh, we return a land, play it, uh, and then we can make a creature attack and the next combat. So if the annoying control mage has a control piece just sitting back, not doing anything. We can force that attack with the Trench Behemoth, which is always really nice to have utility in Commander. Next is the Scourge of Fleets. For 5 blue-blue, you get a 6-6 six, six Kraken. When Scourge of Fleets enters the battlefield, return each creature your opponent's control with toughness X or less to its owner's hand, where X is the number of islands you control. So hopefully we're going to have quite a few islands in our Demir deck and Scourge of Fleets is basically just going to Cyclonic Rift Creatures and let us attack in for some big damage. Next is the Shipbreaker Kraken for 4 blue-blue. This Kraken has Monstrosity 6 blue-blue. It's got Monstrosity 4. So if the creature isn't monstrous, we pay the Monstrosity cost. We put 4 one, one counters on it. And then it becomes monstrous. When Shipbreaker Kraken becomes monstrous, tap up to 4 target creatures. Those creatures don't untap during your controller's untap step as long as you control Shipbreaker Kraken. So it's just going to lock down the board. And then its tokens also have Monstrosity 4, if I am correct. And we can basically just lock down our opponents and attack in for big damage. Next is the Stormtide Leviathan for 5, blue, blue, blue. It's a giant creature Leviathan at 8-8. Eight, eight. Uh, it's got Island Walk and all lands are islands in addition to their other types. So it's going to mana fix us and screw our opponents because it has Island Walk. Creatures without flying or Island Walk cannot attack. So it might lock down some of our Krakens, but 
having this thing be an 8-8 is going to be really annoying for our opponents, and especially with Crothus, because he does have flying. He attacks in with the Stormtide Leviathan. We make two token copies, and then it just becomes more of a headache, because now instead of just getting rid of the one Stormtide, now there's two additional Stormtide Leviathans out that say creatures without flying or Iron Walk can't attack. Next is the Deep Sea Kraken. So for 7, blue, 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 the Deep Sea Kraken can't be blocked at 6-6. Six, six. The Deep Sea Kraken also has to spend 9. So to suspend the Deep Sea Kraken, we're going to pay 2 and a blue. We exile the Deep Sea Kraken with 9 suspend counters on it. And the interesting thing about the Deep Sea Kraken is that whenever an opponent casts a spell, we can remove a suspend counter from it. And when the suspend counter hits 0, we can cast the Deep Sea Kraken without paying its mana cost. So you wouldn't think this thing is really interesting, especially because it's so much mana and the suspend cost is so high. But once Crothus starts making token copies of a 6-6 that can't be blocked, we're going to start rolling damage through pretty quickly. Next is the Lockmire Serpent, which is out of Eldraine, which I feel like didn't get enough play or enough attention when it first came out. But the Lockmire Serpent is 4 blue and a black for a 7-7 seven, seven Serpent with Flash. We pay one blue and sacrifice an island. Lockmire Serpent can't be blocked this turn. We pay a black and sacrifice a swamp. We gain one life and draw a card. We pay Demir, blue and a black, exile five target cards from an opponent's graveyard. Return the Lockmire Serpent from your graveyard to your hand. Activate it uh, as a sorcery. So basically this thing just has flash. It's a 7-7. Seven, seven. We sack an island. It can't be blocked so we can get some finishing damage off on someone. We pay a black and sack a swamp. We draw cards. Oh, and, and then uh, it can recur itself from a graveyard. So it controls our opponent's graveyards by exiling cards from them to bring itself back, and it's just basically something that's really hard to get rid of. Next is the Icebreaker Kraken, which actually came out in uh, the Kaldheim set. It's 10 blue-blue, but it costs one less for each snow land you control, so maybe you want to consider running uh, some snow islands and snow swamps. When Icebreaker Kraken enters the battlefield, artifacts and creatures target opponent controls don't untap during their next untap step return three snow lands you control to their owner hand their owner's hand return icebreaker kraken to its owner's hand so this thing basically just has protection if we are running snow lands which are made pretty accessible by Kaldheim, and its mana cost goes down so if we have 10 lands which uh, hopefully we have some quite a few lands in play as we have a lot of creatures that cost a ton of mana this thing is just going to be blue blue it locks down an opponent and then when it enters the battlefield so it has a pretty sick etb and when crothus starts making tokens of it we're just going to lock an opponent down next is the pearl lake ancient it's five blue blue with uh for a leviathan with flash it has power six toughness seven and the pearl lake ancient cannot be countered and it has prowess so whenever we cast a non-creature spell, the Pearl Lake Ancient gets 1-1 one, one until end of turn. Return three lands you control to their owner's hand. Pearl Lake Ancient, return Pearl Lake Ancient to its owner's hand. So it has a little bit of protection. It's a mythic. It's got flash. It's a 6-7. It can be a good blocker, and it can get stronger for casting non-creature spells. Not that this is the most popular card, but I just wanted to include it because of its mythic rarity, and it fits in our creature type. Next is the Junk Winder for 5 blue-blue. It's actually an uncommon serpent. It's got an affinity for tokens, so this spell costs one less for each token you control. And with our commander making two tokens of all of our Leviathan, Octopus, Squids, Eels, Fish, and whatever else it makes, this Junkwinder is going to basically cost two blue-blue faster than you know. Whenever a token enters the battlefield under your control, tap target non-land permanent and opponent controls. It doesn't untap. So it's a 5-6 that's going to cost us basically two blue mana. And whenever tokens enter the battlefield, we get to lock down stuff and have it not untap. And Crothus is just going to keep making two tokens. And this Junkwinder is just going to keep tapping our opponent's boards and let us swing in with our giant massive fish. Next is the Mesmerizing Benthid. So for three blue-blue, it is an octopus. I believe the first octopus on this list. When Mesmerizing Benthid enters the battlefield, create two O2 blue illusion creature tokens with whenever this creature blocks a creature, that creature doesn't untap during its controller's untap step. Mesmerizing Benthid has hexproof as long as you control an illusion. So this thing will just be kind of cool to make copies of because when it enters, you make the O2 uh, squid or O2 blue uh, illusions. And so if we have multiple ones of these, we're just going to be making blockers for days. And then if anyone tries to attack us, we chump with our little O2 blockers, and then their stuff doesn't untap. So it really de 
incentivizes being attacked, and then we're just going to keep making tokens and tokens and tokens unless we're stopped. Next is another uncommon called the Wormhole Serpent, so for four and a blue. Uh, it just has the activated ability of three and a blue. Target creature can't be blocked this turn. It's not really much more powerful than that, but it basically just says here's some free damage because Krothus needs to attack in order to make those tokens. Next is one of the cheapest Krakens on our list. So for one blue blue, we have the Nadir Kraken. Whenever you draw a card, you may pay one, and if you do, put a 1-1 one, one counter on Nadir Kraken and make a 1-1 one, one blue tentacle creature token so it just makes blockers and gets bigger. This is just a cool include as it's, again, not the highest costing Kraken, uh, but its power and toughness is 2-3, and it's only going to grow as the game gets farther on. Next is one of my favorite cards from Ixalan, the Fleet Swallower. So for 5 blue blue, we get a 6-6 six, six fish. Whenever Fleet Swallower attacks... Target player puts the top half of their library rounded up into their graveyard. So this thing just traumatizes someone. And when we start making a bunch of tokens, we can just attack all of our opponents and everybody's just going to start milling half their library. So that's actually going to wrap up our regular Kraken, Octopus, Leviathan list. Uh, and now we're going to move more into the legendary creature side. So things that you're not exactly going to want to make a, a bunch of tokens of with Krothus. But these things are just good to have in your deck as lieutenants, second generals that can just benefit to what you're already doing with our current theme. So first up is going to be Lorthos, the Tide Maker for five blue, blue, blue. It's a legendary creature, Octopus. It's an eight, eight. Whenever Lorthos, the Tide Maker, attacks, you may pay eight mana, eight colorless. If you do, tap up to eight target permanents. Those permanents don't untap during their controller's untap step, so we can just tap down our opponent's stuff, their lands even, and then just swing in. Next is another 8-8, eight, eight, Octavia, Living Thesis. So for 8 blue blue, this spell costs 8 less to cast if you have 8 or more instant or sorcery cards in your graveyard, which we might if we want to throw in some utility along with our Leviathans and Krakens. Uh, it has Ward 8, so it can't be the target of a spell or ability our opponents control unless they pay 8 mana. And it has Magecraft. Whenever you copy, cast or copy an instant or sorcery spell, target creature gets a base, base power toughness 8-8 eight, eight until end of turn. So to make Krothus, instead of a 3-5, we make him an 8-8 eight, eight with Octavia. Things are going to start getting pretty interesting. Next is probably my favorite creature on this list, and I actually used to have a deck dedicated to him. It would be Rexiel, the Risen Deep. I remember first seeing the art for this guy, and seeing his mana cost scared me a little bit, but he was so darn cool. I love everything about him. I dismantled the deck, unfortunately, but I have very, very fond memories. This deck was very dependent on what my opponents had in their libraries as I would mill them, then attack with Rexiel, make every make all lands, islands, or swamps, attack in with Rexiel, and get to cast their stuff for free. But anyway, Rexiel is a 3 blue, blue, black. So 6 mana for a legendary Kraken being a 5, 8. He has Island Walk and Swamp Walk. Whenever Rexiel the Risen Deep deals combat damage to a player, you may cast target instant or sorcery from that player's graveyard without paying its mana cost. If that card were to be put into a graveyard, exile it. Nothing more to really say. Rexiel is just good stuff in this deck. You're not going to really copy him because he's obviously legendary, but if... Your opponents are playing blue or black, or you make them play blue or black with some of your Leviathans that are going to give every make all land swamps. Rectiel's going to attack in, deal 5 damage, and you get to cast some removal or maybe even an extra turn spell with him. Next is Brineland, the Moon Kraken. So for 6 blue blue, you get a 6 8 Kraken. When Brineland, the Moon Kraken, enters the battlefield, or whenever you cast a spell with converted mana cost 6 or greater, you may return target non-land permanent to its owner's hand. So if we make the two copies, the two token copies of Brineland, we get to return something, and then we can just sacrifice the copies. So basically, we're just going to return stuff for free. Next is Nezhal, the Primal Tide, one of my favorite Elder Dinosaurs. So for five blue blue, this spell can't be countered. You have no maximum hand size. Whenever an opponent casts a non-creature spell, draw a card. So it does not say may. You have to. Then if we discard three cards, exile Nezhal, return it to the battlefield tapped under its... Uh, controller's control uh, under its owner's control at the beginning of the next end step so he just has evasion he has card draw he can't be countered he's a 7-7 elder dinosaur he's pretty cool next is slin voda the ri the rising deep so for six blue blue we get a legendary leviathan with kicker 
Uh, the kicker cost is one and a blue. When Slin Voda, Rising Deep, enters the battlefield, if it was kicked, return all creatures to their owner's hand except for Merfolk Kraken, Leviathan, Octopus, and Serpent. So it's basically Cyclonic Rift on a creature. Next is a super cool creature that doesn't get enough love, in my opinion, is Tromocrantis. I remember this thing being like the big bad boy of my uh, first EDH group when, when we were all starting out. So Tromocrantis is five blue-blue. Uh, he has Hexproof unless it's attacking or blocking. Tromocrantis can't be blocked unless all creatures defending player control block it. It's an 8-8 eight eight that's just going to powerhouse. It's going to force blocks uh, to block just him, or he's going to smash in for eight damage. Uh, next is a really interesting card that I really liked in this list, just for some value. Uh, that would be Gyruda, Doom of Depths. And he's four, and then he's hybrid, Demir, Demir. Uh, he's got companions, so the companion mechanic's a little uh, convoluted, so I'm really not going to touch on that right now. But when Gyruda enters the battlefield, each player puts the top four cards of their library into their graveyard, and then you put a creature card with an even converted mana cost from among those cards onto the battlefield under your control. So even if we make tokens of Gyruda and then sacrifice them, we still get that ability. So making tokens of him is going to be really cool and really fun, and we're just going to get a ton of value from it. The last legendary creature on our list is Cherix, the ra the Raging Isle. So for two blue-blue, we get a legendary Leviathan Crab. Spells your opponent's cast that target Cherix, cost two more to cast. And then we pay three mana, and Cherix gets minus, plus X, minus X until end of turn, where X is the number of islands you control. And he's a 0 17. So he's the best blocker that you're probably ever going to have. And then if we attack in and they say, oh, no blocks, we pay the three, and he becomes a he becomes a 16 1, depending on how many islands we have. I just thought he was a cool little include for this list, as he probably isn't going to get much love elsewhere besides the Leviathan, Kraken, Crab, Fish deck. So that's actually going to round out our creature and legendary creature topics so now we're going to actually get more into the support of the deck and to start out the support listing we are going to look at the legendary artifact kefnet's monument so the monument cycle uh, that came in amonkhet is really cool and definitely one of my favorite things they're uncommons just to throw in commander decks uh, if it meets the colors and kind of goes with what you're doing so kefnet's monument uh, is three mana and says blue creatures that you cast costs one less to cast, and whenever you cast a creature spell, target creature an opponent controls doesn't untap during its controller's untap step. So, it's not going to tap a creature, but if a creature is tapped from attacking or using an ability, Kevnet's Monument is going to keep them tapped so we can attack in more effectively with all of our crabs and serpents and leviathans. Uh, next is a uh, really similar thing. Uh, the Sapphire Medallion, so blue spells cost one less to cast, and this is just because our Krakens and Leviathans are going to be stupid expensive. Um, we can definitely throw in the Black Medallion or Bantu's Monument to do blue and black spells costing one less to cast to uh, obviously get our commander cost down if our opponents are just uh, bottlenecking our commander all game. So these four things, uh, I'm only going to include the two for the, the blue just because I think more of the Leviathans and Krakens are blue, so those would help us if we're needing to cut cards we don't really need the Black Medallion or the Bantu's Monument, but the blue one just keeps things tapped, and the blue medallion just helps us reduce all of our other Leviathans and Krakens, not just our commander. Uh, so next is another enchantment called Heartless Summoning. So for two mana, one in a black, creature spells you control cost two less to cast, but creatures you control get minus one, minus one. So this is just going to make our big boys, our seven, eight mana boys, two less to cast, and they are going to get minus one, minus one, but they're being large leviathans and octopus they're going to be six sixes seven sevens eight eights so losing one power and one toughness shouldn't really affect us too much on the board as our things should hopefully be larger than our opponents next we're going to talk about whelming wave so for two blue blue return all creatures to their owner's hands except for krakens leviathans octopus and serpents so this is basically just a one-sided board wipe for us Maybe our opponents are playing some sort of good leviathans or octopus or serpents at some point in the game. But again, if we return all the tokens, all the warriors, all the humans, whatever, to our opponent's hands, and we get to keep our entire board, one person gets to keep one thing, not a bad trade at all. We basically are just going to swing out. We're going to kill a couple of our opponents. Next is engulf the shore. So return to their owner's hands all creatures with toughness less than your less than or equal to the number of islands you control. So it does say all creatures, so that includes yours. 
But this is basically just another instance of of a quote unquote board wipe. Uh, you know, we're not going to talk about damnation or toxic deluge because those are pretty obvious that we're going to include. I just wanted to talk about a few things that kind of fit our theme of like battling with the sea and Kraken's Leviathan. So that would definitely fit Underwhelming Wave and Engulf the Shore. And the next one we're about to talk about, which is Crush of Tentacles. So for four blue blue, it's a sorcery with a surge cost. And the surge cost says, Surge is three blue blue. You may cast this spell for its surge. If you or a teammate cast it, another spell this turn. So we play a one mana cantrip or something like that. This is going to cost one less. It doesn't seem like much. But it says return all non-land permanents to their owner's hands. And if Crush of Tentacles surge cost was paid, you create an 8-8 blue octopus creature token. So basically, if you cast another spell, we're super late in the game. We get to more or less board wipe, uh, you know, cyclonic rift. And then we get to create an 8-8 octopus that everyone else is going to have to contend with. So after our opponents are done rebuilding their board states, we have an 8-8 that can just attack in and wreck some face. After that, I wanted to talk about Ominous Seas, just because it fits more of the theme. This card is an uncommon that came out of Ikoria. So for one and a blue, whenever you draw a card, put a foreshadow counter on Ominous Seas. Remove eight foreshadow counters from Ominous Seas and create an 8-8 blue Kraken, uh, creature token. And it has cycling too. So this card, I think, just fits our theme in a lot of ways. So in Commander, we're going to be drawing cards. You know, obviously, one every turn. And then if we can do that more with our creatures or our... Uh, other things that we put in the deck, Ominous Seas, basically is just going to start making 8-8 Krakens by us just playing the game. And that's why I really love including this card in my blue decks, just because it's going to sit on the battlefield and more or less do nothing. It doesn't seem super threatening. Your opponents don't really want to use a removal spell on an, un on an uncommon enchantment. So it just really, it comes down at a low cost and just kind of sits there. And then you don't even have to pay. You don't have to tap. You don't have to do anything. You just remove those counters and you get an 8-8. So you can do that at an opponent's end step and get an 8-8 with more or less haste. And then it's got cycling too. So if you really don't want to pay the two mana or you really need something, you're in dire need for a removal spell or something, you can pay two and cycle, discard, and draw a card and get this thing out of your hand. So I think it just fits really well. It's a really versatile card. Next, I want to talk about High Tide. And I'm sure many of you are thinking... Now, this card was, of course, going to be on this list. It's one uh, blue mana at an instant speed until end of turn. Whenever a player taps an island for mana, they add an additional blue to their mana pool. This is basically if we have five islands, we pay the one blue with an artifact or something. We cast high tide. Now our five islands now become 10 mana. Uh, and then that's uh, not even including our other mana rocks or our swamps. So basically high tide is just going to allow us to play our gigantic Kraken boys really early and just take control of the game. The next card I want to talk about is Kira, Best of the Sea God. Uh, it's seven mana. It's a really high-end enchantment, but it's definitely good for the cost. So it's five blue-blue, uh, and then it's the Saga uh, enchantment style. So the first, as it enters, you put a Saga counter on it, and you create an 8-8 blue Kraken with Hexproof. It's really nice having that Hexproof built in. Uh, then at your upkeep, you're going to put another counter on this at your next turn. So tap all non-land permanents, target opponent controls, and they don't untap. So you can just kill the problem player or just tap someone down and keep them open for everyone else, depending on how the board state looks. And then the third is gain control of target permanent and opponent controls and untap it. So basically this card, it's very high mana cost, but it's going to give us an 8-8 blue Kraken. It's going to fit our theme. It's going to tap someone down to deliver a killing blow. And then to add insult to injury, we can steal the best thing on the board from the other players that are still alive. And last but not, not least is the quest for Ula's Temple. So I actually, this was a new card to me. So it's one blue mana for an enchantment. At the beginning of your upkeep, you may look at the top card of your library. If it is a creature card, you may reveal it and put a quest counter on quest for Ula's Temple. At the beginning of each end step, if there are three or more quest counters on quest for Ula's Temple, you may put a Kraken, Leviathan, Octopus, or Serpent Creature card from your hand onto the battlefield. So obviously, you can tell why this card is here. I don't really think I need to do much explaining. Our deck is going to be loaded with giant creatures, and this basically just allows us to play one for free. If it has three or more counters on it, which we should hopefully be doing, we're going to have top deck manipulation with our commander, and this card just fits into that theme as well. So I think that's actually going to do it for this Commander Quick Look on Runo Stormkirk. So just to recap, Runo is a 3-mana 1-4 with flying, so he's a great blocker on his own. He enters the battlefield and up to one target creature from our graveyard on the top of our library. And at the beginning of our upkeep, we look at the top card and you may reveal that creature if it's a creature card with mana 6 or greater. 
we transform Runo so he can come down as this cheap three mana one four and then immediately on our next turn or if we take an, an, an extra turn spell we just get to do this immediately and he becomes Crothus Lord of the Deep with flying still he's a three five so he's not exactly the toughest uh, and most powerful creature but he's got the flying which is still nice and whenever Crothus Lord of the Deep attacks create a tapped and attacking token that's a copy of another target attacking creature doesn't necessarily have to be our theme of Leviathan, Kraken, Octopus, or Serpent. But if that creature is a Kraken, Leviathan, Octopus, or Serpent, create two of those tokens instead. So what I did in this quick look is I basically just went through on that theme of the Kraken, Leviathan, Octopus, or Serpent. But what's really cool about Runo is that his flip side doesn't say that they have to be those. You can make a copy of any creature, a token copy of any creature. And it also... We don't have to sundial of the infinite ourselves to get around this. It doesn't say until end of turn. You just make a token. So if you happen to have Consecrated Sphinx or if you happen to have a Mull Drifter out, you can just make a copy of those. You don't need to get the double copy, but that's certainly what we want. And that's what I wanted to go over in this quick look. But feel free to add in any other blue or black card that you just want multiple copies of that are going to just drown your opponents out. So hopefully this Commander Quick Look really gave you some interesting ideas behind Runo Stormkirk and Crothus, Lord of the Deep. And let me know in the comments below how you decide to build your Runo, what interesting cards that you put in, what you have found that works really well. Maybe things that aren't Kraken, Leviathan, Octopus, or anything of that matter. If it's just something different, because I knew that there was a lot of buzz surrounding Runo Stormkirk when he got previewed and everyone was losing their minds at this really cool commander and he was in cool colors he wasn't necessarily control but he was tribal but many different tribes uh in the kraken leviathan realm and then after he was released there was no hype for him he got no play in standard i've never seen this card played on magic arena and I, after that he just completely died out nobody was building him nobody said anything about him everyone thought he was so cool and he was going to be so niche in Commander, and then I just haven't heard a single word about this guy, so I wanted to just give a Commander quick look on him, because I think he's cool, and I want to know your thoughts in the comments below. So if you want to support this channel, make sure to like and subscribe this, to this video, and make sure to check me out on Twitch, where I'm trying to stream every Monday around 7 to 10 p.m. Don't to play some Magic Arena, so just drop in and say hey, and let me know if you like the content, and just make sure to support it on YouTube and on Twitch at Azerain. Thanks for watching.